Uh, Luke chapter 4, and we'll start at verse number 16. And he, which is Jesus, came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up. And as his custom was, he went in the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up to read. And there was delivered unto him the book of the prophet Isaiah. And when he had opened the book, he found the place where it was written. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to preach to the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives, and recovering the sight of the blind, to set liberty of them that are bruised, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. And he closed the book, and he gave it again to the minister and sat down. And the eyes of all of them that were in the synagogues were fastened on him. And he began to say unto them, This day is the scripture fulfilled in your ears. And all bear witness, bear him witness, and wondered at the gracious words that proceeded out of his mouth. And they said, Is this not Joseph's son? And he said unto them, You will surely say unto me, this prophet, Physician, heal thyself. Whatsoever ye have done in Capernaum, do also here in thy country. But I tell you of a truth. Many widows were in Israel in the days of Isaiah, when the heavens were shut up three years and for six months, and great famine was throughout all the land. But unto none of them was a light sent, of, save unto Sarepta, the city of Sidon, unto a woman that was a widow. And many lepers were in the Israel in the time of Isaiah the prophet, and none of them were cleansed, they Naaman the Syrian. And all that in the synagogue, when they heard these things, were filled with wrath, and rose up and thrust him out of the city, and led him unto the brow of the hill wherein the city was built, that they might cast him down headlong. And he, passing through the midst of them, went his way. Thank you, Shane. Uh, the next song for this morning will be number 397, I Have Decided to Follow Jesus.
the last song for this morning's service, number 166. Cleanse me, O Lord. 166. Settling when the uh, song leader flirts with the pianist so openly. But uh, I guess if it's his wife, it's okay. You know? It's all for me. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's uh, good to be in church this morning. Amen. A couple of things I, I failed to mention in the announcements. Uh, the mother's room up the back is still all open. If you need somewhere to take your look, you can uh, get out into the back there through the kitchen, and there's a room out there with. Uh, if you just touch the screen of the iPad, you'll see there's a volume control there, so you can decide whether you want to listen to the preacher or whether you don't. Um, you can actually control the volume, but you should be able to hear from uh, the room here anyway. So if you need that space, so make yourself avail, avail yourself of it. There's something else I forgot, and I've still forgotten it. So John chapter 4. John chapter 4 is where we'll be. And uh, we're going to read a short passage of Scripture. And uh, then we'll uh, have a word of prayer that the Lord might have His hand upon us and we'll enter into uh, the sermon this morning. So we'll be up and standing as we read the word of the Lord. If you're able to this morning, if it's something you can do with comfort, stand for the reading of the word, John chapter 4. And uh, we're going to pick up the reading in verse 31. John chapter 4, 
verse 31. In the meanwhile, his disciples prayed him, saying, Master, eat. But he said unto them, I have meat to eat that ye know not of. Therefore said the disciples one to another, Hath any man brought him aught to eat? Jesus saith unto them, My meat is to do the will of him that sent me, and to finish his work. And we'll have a word of prayer this morning. Our Heavenly Father, I do thank you and, uh, and praise you, Lord, that we can come to your house and uh, lift up our voices in praise. Uh, we can edify one another in, in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. We can lift up our voices uh, in glory and magnification of your name. Lord, I pray that uh, you would be magnified this morning, that everything we say and do would be pleasing to you, would be done in a way that is uh, led of your spirit and yielded to you, Lord. I pray, my Lord, that you'd help me as I preach your word, you would speak through me. Help me, Heavenly Father, to uh, speak plainly and clearly. And uh, most, most importantly, Lord, speak the truth of your word uh, as you would lead me. I thank you and praise you, Lord, for the confidence we have in you. I ask that you might have free course in the service. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. You can be seated. John chapter 4, we've been working through it slowly, we've been uh, just step by step in the interaction that Jesus has had with this uh, woman at the well in Samaria, and uh, last week we looked at his disciples coming back and the woman had gone off to the town and, and uh, Jesus is speaking with his disciples and they've brought him lunch, they've brought him food, and uh, as they offer him food... Jesus makes this statement, I have meat to eat that you know not of. And last week we looked at the meat that Jesus had that they didn't understand, that they knew nothing about, was to do the will of the Father. Jesus' meat that he had to partake of, that was his sustenance, that was his provision, that was uh, esteemed higher than his necessary meats, as Job put it, was to do the will of the Father. And we looked at the fact that there is... Uh, there is a very, very big difference between uh, the will of man and the will of God. And uh, then you add into the mix of that that there's the will of the devil actively at work in this world. And we need to be careful that we're busy about the Father's will and not about our own will. But it wasn't just the will of God that Jesus said he must be about. He didn't say that the only thing he had was God's will that was his necessary meats. But he makes this statement... I have meat to eat that you know not of. My meat is to do the will of him that sent me and to finish his work. There is both the will of God and the work of God. And Jesus didn't just point out that there was this ambiguous will of God floating in the air somewhere that he was aware of and doing nothing about. The will of God was something he did. Not something he knew about, not something he understood, but something he put into action in our lives. It's very important that we be not just hearers of the word, but doers also. And you know, we can be very prone to that, sitting under solid teaching, solid homes, godly parents, godly influence. We can get very, very used to the clear teaching of God's word being presented to us, that we just become somewhat numb to it. We come in, we sit down, whether it be at the dining room table, whether it be in the pew, whether it be in the Sunday school class, whether it be in the Bible study, and we sit down and we hear the preaching of God's Word and we listen to it. We might even feel some conviction from it. We might even understand the working of the Holy Spirit trying to convict us and, uh, and work in us, and we leave on out of here and we do nothing about it. Much like those two boys in the Bible, when the father said to them to go and work in his field, one said he would go and went not. The other one said, I won't go. Then he repented and he went. And Jesus asked, which one did the will of the father? And it's an obvious question. Not the one that said yes, but the one that did yes. Jesus wasn't just a yes man. He wasn't just someone that said, oh, I'll do God's will and made big, big announcements and spooking things about it. The Bible said he, was to do, he was, would do the will of the Father. But here, 
What we want to look at this morning is this statement where he said, and finish his work. His work. Well, work isn't a very, very popular topic, is it? You know, it's not really something we just get all that excited about. Uh, you can't come to school holidays, a bunch of kids on school holidays, and they're thinking about all the things they might do and all the things that might get done. Then dad comes along and busts all their, their hopes and dreams because he said, well, now you're off school, I've got some work I need you to do. And dashes all their hopes and dreams of, of lazy free days. Go with me to Genesis, if you would. Genesis chapter 2. In Genesis chapter 2, I just want you to see something from the very beginning here. Remind you of something to uh, just put this back on your radar. I'm sure you've read it before. I hope you're aware of this. If you've spent any time in the Word of God, I hope you've read this passage and understand this about God. Genesis chapter 2, verse 1. Thus the heavens and the earth were finished, and all the host of them. And on the seventh day, God ended His work. See, work isn't a cause, work isn't a, isn't a result of sin. Work isn't a result of the fall. Work isn't something that's come upon you because mankind is sinful and God's punishing you. And if it wasn't for Adam and Eve, you'd be able to lay on the couch all day and not do any work. God, from the very beginning, was a God of work. He, he, he brought this world into existence. He had a work to do, and in Genesis chapter 2, the Bible says on the seventh day, God ended His work. I have a great ability to start projects. I have a great ability to start jobs. Finishing them, not so great at. I've got to discipline myself to finish what I started. To, to, bring, to a, bring to a close that which I began. God here, he got, to, he got to the end of His work and the Bible says that, that He finished and He rested. God ended His work which He had made and He rested on the seventh day from all His work which He had made and God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it because that in it He had rested from all His work which God created and made. And so I just wanted you to see the creative hand of God, that the creative hand of God had with it the working hand of God. God has a work that He's doing. He always has had a work that He's doing. He always will have a work that He's doing. And He has, he has this rest from that work of creation and He moves on and is at work in creation. Now that the Lord has finished the creative work, He is in the business, I guess you might say, of the, the, uh, the, 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 the oversight work, the, the, the running of the place. In Him we live and move and have our being. It's the Lord's work in your life. Someone says, what's God ever done for me? Every time your heart beats in your chest is because God has allowed it. Because in Him you live and move and have your being. We just don't acknowledge it to God. We just don't lay it at His feet. God is merciful to us. His mercies are new every morning. It's by His mercies that we're not consumed. God's at work by being merciful. God's at work in this world. He's, there, there's not a sparrow that falls without God being aware of it. There's not a hair in your head that recedes. I know a fellow who, he woke up one morning and he suddenly realized that the cow lick that he'd had for the last 40 years on his forehead had gotten up and ran away in the dark of the night. Someone had stolen that curl. You know, it, it didn't catch God off guard as one by one those hairs receded from that cow lick. And God was just waiting for the day for that man to go, Oh, I just realized. And for his wife to go, it didn't disappear. It receded. It didn't change. It just stopped growing there. Nobody stole it. God's at work in minute ways that we're not aware of. But go with me to Acts chapter 13. In my planning of this sermon, this was where I was going to finish. I believe the Lord might have a start here in Acts chapter 13. 
Acts chapter 13 and find your place in verse 16. Here, Paul is being sent out with Barnabas and they're, they're busy on their first missionary journey. And he lands in Antioch, in Poseidon, in verse 14, and went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and sat down. You know where he went? He went to the religious stronghold. He went to those who were given the oracles of God. The oracles of God is the Old Testament. The law and commandments. He went to the synagogue, to those that knew the Bible, to those that knew God's Word. He went to those that had God's Word. Here Paul goes out on his missionary journey in verse 14. He went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and sat down. And after the reading of the law and the prophets, the rulers of the synagogue sent unto them, saying, Ye men and brethren, if ye have any word of exhortation for the people, say on. Here Paul was given opportunity and an invitation to exhort the brethren to exhort the congregation there. And so Paul stood up and beckoning with his hand, said, Men of Israel, and ye that fear God, give audience. He said, I want to talk to Israel. I want to talk to those that fear God. I want you to give audience to me, to pay attention to me, to what I have to say. He said, The God of this people of Israel chose our fathers and exalted the people when they dwelt as strangers in the land of Egypt. And with a high arm, brought he them out of it. And he starts to talk about the work that God had done in Israel's history in bringing them out of Egypt. That the Lord had worked in times past and brought them forth out of there. And about that time of 40 years suffered he their manners in the wilderness. Here's verse 18. And I just just love the way the Lord has had this put. That about time of 40 years... God suffered he their manners in the wilderness. Have you ever had to suffer somebody's bad manners? I mean, you're not, you're not, you're not enjoying their manners, you're suffering their manners. That's what God did with Israel. He suffered their manners in the wilderness. He's a long-suffering God. I think back to many a time in my life where the Lord has suffered my manners in the wilderness. And he hasn't been pleased with me, but he's suffered me. You know, Jesus said, Suffer the little children to come unto me, for such is the kingdom of heaven. I love little kids. They're beautiful. I love, I love being around kids. I love having a house full of kids. But sometimes you just got to extend a fair bit of patience, right? Sometimes there's some things that goes on in a little kid's head that it's like, where'd that come from? Sometimes it can wear down the patience. The foolishness that's in a child. I turn around and I think about that and I wonder how many times the Lord has had to look down at the foolishness of man and just be patient and suffer them like a little child. I go, well... They're just, they're just in, their, in their silly mindset that I'll lead them out of and I'll work in them. And here's Israel as a young nation and God suffered their manners in the wilderness. Paul's talking to Israel and them that fear God about the work that God had done. When he, when God had destroyed seven nations in the land of Chanan, he divided their land, by, their land to them by lot. And after that, he gave unto them judges about the space of 450 years until Samuel the prophet. And afterward, they desired a king. And God gave unto them Saul, the son of Sis, a man of the tribe of Benjamin by the space of 40 years. And when he had removed him, He raised up unto them David to be their king, to whom also he gave testimony and said, I have found David, the son of Jesse, a man after mine own heart, which shall fulfill all my will. Israel went into Canaan land and drove out the inhabitants. And as far as God was concerned, God drove them out because without God, they could do nothing. It was God that brought down the walls of Jericho. And it was God that had them lose the battle of Ai 
to teach them a lesson that He then gave them the battle of Ai to deliver the city into their hand. It was God that raised up Saul. It was God that brought him down. It was God that raised up David. It's God that raises up kings and raises up thrones and sets them down. Anthony Albanese isn't our Prime Minister because of the popular vote of Australia. He's our Prime Minister because God suffered it to be so. Because God raises up and God brings down. He did it in Israel's day. He does it still. He turns the hearts of a king like a river whithersoever he will. When he had removed him, he raised up unto them David in verse 22. Verse 23, Of this man's seed hath God, according to his promise, raised unto Israel a Saviour, Jesus. And he changes track from Israel's history to Israel's present day. And he states this, Of this man's seed, of David's seed, hath God, according to his promise, raised unto Israel a Saviour, Jesus. When God had first preached, sorry, when John had first preached before his people the baptism of repentance to all the people of Israel, as an, and as John fulfilled his course, he said, Whom think ye that I am? I am not he, but there, behold, there cometh one after me, whose shoes of his feet I am not worthy to loose. Men and brethren, children of the stock of Abraham, and whoever so among you feareth God, to you is the word of this salvation sent. For they that dwell at Jerusalem and their rulers, because they knew Him not, nor yet the voices of the prophets which are read every Sabbath day, they have fulfilled them in condemning Him. And though they found no cause of death in Him, yet desired they Pilate that He should be slain. And Paul runs into the account of Jesus of Nazareth, who came unto His own, and His own accepted Him not. And they knew Him not. He was despised and rejected of men. A man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And here is the Saviour of Israel. God runs through Israel's history about what God had done in raising them up. And He steps then into the gift of Jesus Christ. The Saviour of mankind. Given there to Israel. And as He speaks to them of it, He goes to the, the witness of John and He goes to the witness of, of Christ and He goes and gives His own witness and He goes to the rejection and the despising. That without fault, yet they desired they Pilate that He should be slain. And when they had fulfilled all that was written of Him, they took Him down from the tree and laid Him in a sepulchre but God raised him from the dead. Here's the thing. Paul gets to preaching and he gets to preaching historical facts that everybody knew about. And said that was God's doing. And then he got to preaching present day developments in the life of Israel. This Jesus Christ of Nazareth that they all were aware of. This teacher, master, rabbi. This one that was turning, had turned Israel on its head. That a great multitude followed and then Rejected, and he ran through this and said, This is the promise, the fulfillment of God's promise of a Savior. But here at the end, he steps into something that wasn't historical fact, that wasn't subject to people's opinions of who it was and who it wasn't. I mean, some liked Christ and some didn't. But here, John steps into the realm of the impossible to a Saviour that was raised from the dead. And said that was God's work. The history was God's work. The giving of Christ was God's work. 
and the raising of Jesus from the dead was God's work. God raised Him from the dead. And He didn't leave it at that. He said He He was seen many days of them which came up with Him from Galilee to Jerusalem, who are His witnesses unto the people. And we declare unto you glad tidings, how that the promise which was made unto the fathers, God hath fulfilled the same unto us their children, in that He hath raised up Jesus again, as it is also written in the second psalm. And he starts giving Old Testament quotes. Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. And as concerning that he raised him up from the dead, now no more to return to corruption, he said on this wise, I will give you the sure mercies of David. Wherefore he saith also in another psalm, Thou shalt not suffer thine holy one to see corruption. He gives the promises that are, acquainted to Christ, that are applied to Christ. And then he gives a, st- a promise here and he does some correcting of their theology. Wherefore he saith also in another psalm, Thou shalt not suffer thine holy one to see corruption. For David, after he had served his own generation by the will of God, fell on sleep and was laid unto his fathers and saw corruption. You know what happened to David? David served God. And here they'd taken this statement about David and this promise and they thought that's talking about David. That David won't see corruption. But you know what happened when you dig up David's grave? His body was worm-eaten and corrupted. Nothing but dry bones in dirt. But Christ, He saw no corruption. He He died. He was buried. And He rose incorruptible, untouched. What Paul's doing here, he's saying, you're getting your Old Testament wrong. He's saying, this isn't talking about David. David saw corruption. But he whom God raised again, he saw no corruption in verse 37. Be it known unto you therefore, men and brethren, that through this man is preached unto you, catch this, the forgiveness of of sins. And by Him, by Jesus, all that believe are justified from all things from which ye could, could, could not be justified by the law of Moses. Beware therefore lest that, lest that come upon you which is spoken of in the prophets. And here's what's spoken of in the prophets. Behold ye despises and wonder and perish. He just runs through from Israel's deliverance out of Egypt through to the resurrection of Jesus Christ, the fulfillment of God's promises and the provision of a Savior that that brought forgiveness for the sins of the whole world. And He brought to them the condition of mankind and the entering into that forgiveness by Him all that believe are justified from all things because the law of God won't justify you. You know who he was talking to? He was talking to the synagogue of the Jews, a group of people that were all about working their way to heaven. Keeping the law, keeping the commandments, keeping this, keeping that. And he said, you can't be justified by the works of the law. You can't be justified by how good you are. You can't be justified by all that you do right. Coming to church doesn't set you right before God. Helping an old lady across the street doesn't set you right before God. Giving your millions to charity or to to missions or whatever doesn't set you right before God. It's believing on the Lord Jesus Christ. That's where a man will be justified. And I want you to catch the very end of this, and this is the whole reason of why we're here. Behold, you despisers and wonder and perish. And Paul says this, that as far as God is concerned, I work a work in your days, a work which ye shall in no wise believe, though a man declare it unto you. See, seven days God made the heavens and the earth, six days He made it, and the seventh He rested. And He ended the work of creation. Here in the book of Acts, we see that God is still at work. 
not in the creative work of making this world into existence, but of the redemptive work of bringing man into a relationship with Him. The forgiveness of sins, the believing on the Lord Jesus Christ, the provision of a Savior. And you know what Jesus said here? You know what Paul said here? He said, that's God's work. And it's a work that's God's doing. And though someone preach it unto you and declare it unto you, you won't believe it. God's at work. And you won't believe He is. This is what He's saying to the synagogue of the Jews. God's at work through Jesus Christ. Him who you despised and rejected. You bring that back. Back to John chapter 4. John chapter 4, Jesus said, My meat is to finish His work. Right at the beginning, Acts 13, Jesus already lived a sinless life, dead, buried, rose again, ascended unto the Father. The church is out witnessing and preaching. The apostles are out preaching the Gospel. But in John chapter 4, Jesus is just entering into His ministry and He said, I'm here to finish His work. God had a work that He was doing through Jesus Christ and Jesus said, I'm going to finish it. It's my meat to finish His work. We often sing, and it's a song we well know, I have decided to follow Jesus. If you're going to be a follower of Jesus Christ, you're going to have to get to work. You're going to have to let God do His work in you of salvation, and then you're going to have to get to work about preaching that gospel of salvation. Jesus said, I have work to do. Not just a will to fulfill, but a work to accomplish. Go over a chapter to chapter 5 and in verse 17. John, John chapter 5, verse 17. But Jesus answered them, My Father worketh hitherto, and I work. You know what Jesus is saying? Jesus is summarizing what Paul just did. Hitherto is up to this point. My Father works up to this point, and I work. He said, let me tell you what I'm doing. I'm doing the work the Father's doing. The Father's been working up to this point and I work. Let me ask you, what are you doing? What's your work? Not what is the will of God that is ambiguous and in the sky, but what is the work that you put your hand to? Is it the work of the Father? Do you have something you're doing that you go, that is God's work that I'm busy at? Jesus did. He had a work and it was a work of redemption. It was a work of redemption for the salvation of mankind. John chapter 6, go over a chapter. John chapter 6, verse 26. John chapter 6, verse 26. Jesus answered them and said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, ye seek me, not because you saw the miracles, but because ye did eat of the loaves and were filled. Labor not for the meat which perisheth, but for that meat which endureth unto everlasting life, which the Son of Man shall give unto you, for him hath God the Father sealed. Now let me say this, and just, just drive home this point. It's not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to His mercy that He saved us. You cannot work your way to heaven. You cannot do any work to satisfy God. You cannot do any work to undo your wickedness. But yet with all that said, the Lord says here, labor not for the meat which perisheth, but for that which endureth unto everlasting life. Here was a group of people that were following around and seeking after Jesus. You know why? Because He gave them some loaves and fishes. He gave them some trinkets. He filled their empty tummies. There were some things that God just made nice in their earthly life. And they were following Jesus because of it. And Jesus said, don't labor for the meat which perisheth. Don't set your focus and your efforts to, main, to, to obtain just that, that earthly provision. But seek after that meat which endureth unto everlasting life. Labor for that meat which endureth unto everlasting life. Jesus is saying... 
you're seeking the wrong thing. You go down to verse 29, Jesus said unto them, this is the work of God, that you believe on Him whom He hath sent. See, someone wants to turn around and say, oh, if you go talk about repentance and faith and talk about mankind's got, a, got an act of faith and it's a work man has to do, here the Bible says that, that, uh, that faith, believing on, that's a work of God, that God will do that. I decided to trust my wife. Do you know who did all the work to, just, to, 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 to bring me to the point of trusting her? Her being faithful, her being a trustworthy person, her working in my life as, as a faithful person. It's sort of just a glimmer, just a, just a snippet. Every now and then, every now and then, one of my children lose my trust. And you know what they've got to do? They've got to earn that back. When my kids lose my trust, I don't trust them tomorrow. If they weren't trustworthy yesterday, I'm not going to trust them tomorrow. I'll trust them tomorrow when they were trustworthy yesterday and the day before and the day before that. You know what God got me to? God did a work of faith in my heart where He brought me to a place of faith where I believe that He is and He is a rewarder of them that diligently seek Him. God did a work of faith in my life. Has He done a work of faith in yours? Jesus said here in verse 29, this is the work of God, that ye believe on Him whom He hath sent. This is the work that God's doing. He's not creating new creatures anymore. He's not creating new worlds. His work of creation, He's rested from. He's ended His work of creation. You know what He's doing now? He's working in the hearts of man for belief. That's the work He's doing. It's the work of God that you believe on Him. This is the work of God, that you believe on Him whom He hath sent. That you believe on Christ. Mark chapter 16, we all know it. Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel. Jesus said the work of God is that you believe on the person God has sent. Jesus Christ. You know what your work is? You've been someone that's sent. Are you a disciple of Christ? Are you a believer? God said, go ye. You're to go into all the world and preach the gospel. Romans tells us, how will they hear without a preacher? Jesus was the lamb that was slain from before the foundation of the earth. Before the foundation of the world, He was the lamb that was slain. But He still came. He still came unto His own and His own received Him not. But to them that received Him, He gave power to become the sons of God. Even to them that believe on His name. God's got a work that you need to be doing. And it's a go ye into all the world work. It's a go ye and preach the gospel. It's a go ye as Jesus went work. Jesus said, I'm not just about the will of God, I'm here to finish the work of God that He's got for me to do. And here's the work that Jesus is doing. Here's the work of God that you believe on Him whom He hath sent. Go with me to John chapter 9. John chapter 9 verse 4. In John chapter 9 verse 4, Jesus answered in verse 3, Neither hath this man sinned nor his parents, but that the works of God should be made manifest in him. And Jesus said this, I must work the works of Him that sent me while it is day. The night cometh, when no man can work. He said, I must work the works of Him that sent me. While I've got opportunity, I must work. While I can, I must work. While it is day, I must work. He said this, as long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. Jesus is there. He's been talking to His disciples. They come and offer Him lunch. And He said, I have meat that you know not of. My meat is to do the will of Him that sent me and to finish His work. And you know what God's what God the Father's work was for Jesus? That He would be a light of the world. He said, while I'm in the world, I am a light of the world. I'm not here to fill my belly. I'm here to be a light unto the Gentiles. I'm here to be a light unto this Samaritan woman. I'm not here thinking about the food I want to eat. I'm here thinking about the will of the Father and the purpose He has for me to be a light to those that are around me. While I'm in the world, I am the light of the world. Jesus said, this is the work I'm about. This is the work of God. Are you familiar with Matthew 5? 
Go with me back to Matthew chapter 5. In Matthew chapter 5, find your place in verse 14. Verse 13 says, Ye are the salt of the earth, but if, they, if the salt have lost his savour, wherewith shall it be salted? It is henceforth forth good for nothing, but to be cast out and be trodden under foot of men. Catch verse 14, I think you're familiar with it. Ye are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. Neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel, but on a candlestick, and it giveth light unto all that are in the house. Jesus said, While I am in the world, I am the light of the world. You know what he said to his disciples? Do you know what he said to those that followed him? Do you know what he said to those that believed on his name? He said, ye are the light of the world. Are you a follower of Jesus? Are you a disciple of Christ? Has the work of faith been worked in you? And you've trusted on that name of the only begotten Son of God? Or are you still trying to work your way to heaven? Are you still trying to find some way to avoid the fiery walls of the damned? Jesus said you can't work your way there. It's a work of God. It's by believing on the name of Jesus that you be justified. But if you've been justified by the blood of Jesus Christ, are you going about His work? Are you the light of the world? Do you go out tomorrow? Do you go out today? Do you go to work? Do you go to the supermarket? Do you go to your friend's house? Do you go to the places that you go and go, my purpose here isn't a dinner invite. My purpose here isn't making aluminium. My purpose here isn't exporting coal or teaching students. My purpose here is to be the light of the world. That's the meat that the disciples knew not of. They were earthly focused. Jesus said, no, I have meat you know not of, and my meat is to finish the work of the Father. God's got something for me. And as we go through the Scriptures, we see that God has something for you. God has something for me. In John chapter 17, verse 4, Jesus makes the statement, I have finished the work. He's praying to the Father, just there before the cross of Calvary, just before He hangs there and makes that famous statement of, it is finished. He's there praying unto the Father and saying, I've finished the work. The work which You gave me to do, I've finished it. I know what the work was. I know what my purpose was. And the work of the Father I have done. Go with me to 2 Timothy. We're getting close to the end here this morning. 2 Timothy. In 2 Timothy, chapter 4, Paul is writing to a young preacher trying to encourage him in the faith, trying to encourage him in the work. And in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 6, as he starts closing out this letter, he makes this statement. I'm now ready to be offered. The time of my departure is at hand. Now I well understand, I well understand that the graveyard is full of children and youth. But on the statistics of the thing, on the statistics of the thing, Joan and perhaps Andre are a little closer to their time of departure than Phoebe and Cohen and some of these younger ones. <laughs> oh, I understand the Lord can change that out, but we get old, right? We get old and feeble. Paul here, he's getting to the end. He's saying the time of my departure, it's getting close. But you catch what he says after it? He knows he's coming to the end. He knows it's winding down. And he says, I have fought a good fight. 
And catch this. I have finished my course. He said, the Father gave me a course to run. And I'm about finished it. God has a work for you to do. And if we're going to be a follower of Christ, if we are going to be a spirit-led people, and this is, what, this is what Jesus said to the Samaritan woman, they that worship me must worship me in spirit and in truth. And his disciples come along and said, here, have some food. And he said, fellas, you're missing it. I'm not here for the food. I'm here to be a light unto the Gentiles. I'm here to be a light of the world. I'm here to fulfill the will of the Father and to finish His work. Let me ask you something. Have you even started His work? Or are you still busy in your work? Have you even yielded to God's will for your life? Or are you still bound up in your own will and your own way? All we like sheep have gone astray. We've gone off on the paths of our own foolishness. Have you allowed the Good Shepherd to come and find you? Have you stopped wandering and just started to call on His name and say, Lord, I need You to save me. I need You to do a redemptive work. I'm believing on the work of Jesus Christ, the work of God, that that's what will justify me. That nothing else will deal with my sin. Nothing else will deal with my failures. The wickedness within me, even the evil heart of unbelief, the only thing is the work of Christ that He did on the cross of Calvary. Have you even turned to the Father's work? He has a work to do. And He has a work that He desires to do in your life. And it's a work of salvation. You can't do it, but you can talk to Him that can. You can turn and call upon the name of the Lord. You can come unto Him with the heart man believes unto righteousness. And with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Has your heart believed? under the saving righteousness of Christ and allow that work of salvation to be done by Him in you. If you haven't, you're dead in your trespasses and sins. You're bound up in your own will and the only work you can be partaker of is a work of wood and hay and stubble that will amount to nothing. Nothing for it. But if you're saved this morning, then can I ask you, what work are you busy about? It's one thing to sing, I have decided to follow Jesus. But if you have, there's a work to be done. You didn't follow Christ so you can sit on the couch. That's not what Jesus has for you. He has a work for you to do. A work that He desires for you to be a partaker of. If we had another hour, I could preach the other half of my notes and show verse after verse where the Lord had a particular work like He did for Paul and Barnabas where He said, separate them unto the work whereunto I have called them. Are you willing to trust Jesus? with your eternal destiny, with your eternal soul, and in trust in Him with your eternal soul, are you willing to enter into His labors? To enter into the work of God? It doesn't mean you have to pastor a church. It doesn't mean that you have to, you have to fill a pulpit. But you know what you won't find? You won't find a single verse in here where you're fishing or you're gardening or you're sowing or whatever hobby you have or whatever career path you walk down is the work of God. 
That's just something you got to do as you abide here on this earth to do the work of God. God's in the business of saving souls. I got nothing against garden beds. Plant as many flowers as you like. But God's not in the business of growing watermelons. He's in the business of saving souls. That's the work that God's in. Will you be a part of that work? Will we submit ourselves to that work? Both in ourselves and then be a light to those that are around us. We might have a song to close the sermon out, have decided to follow Jesus. It's a simple one. As we sing it, can I ask you to do something? I don't want anyone looking around. This isn't to embarrass you or anything else. Can I ask something? Can I ask you to sing it if you've decided to follow Jesus? And if you haven't decided to follow Jesus, then just enjoy the singing and have a think about what it is that God wants you to do. Glenn, are you right to leave this, bro? You can steal Mikhail's songbook if you're looking for one.